All right, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, welcome to the next uh, lecture. Um, I just want to give you a quick overview of what's going to happen uh, for the rest of the um, course. So um, essentially, I'm now starting to prepare you for the next uh, and last uh, large assignment, topic-wise. So. Um, uh, last week we talked about regular expressions, which was the topic, which is the topic of this assignment. Um, and so now the upcoming um, lectures will uh, guide you towards the next assignment. So um, today um, I will uh, explain to you or introduce you to a package called Pandas, which you can use to do uh, data analysis. Uh, so that's going to be uh, quite fun. And um, then I will have uh, one more a lecture on um, Python in production, so showing you some of the tools that uh, we use when you go from a simple small program to a kind of production system. So there's some best practices that I want to share. Um, and then I also want to show you um, how to build user interfaces. Uh, so at the moment, all our scripts were essentially terminal programs. Um, but um, if you want to make them more user-friendly, right, um, you want to equip your script with a nice interface. And one very common interface today is, well, either some mobile phone app or a, a web page. Right? And I will show you, um, uh, I chose the path of web programming, which of course can also be used in mobile phones. Um, the last one you can, this will be merged with a, a 12. Uh, but then the last uh, lecture will be on machine learning. So I'll introduce you another package called uh, scikit-learn, um, where, we, where we will do some uh, relatively simple machine learning um, techniques. But um, the idea here is that you get at least, you get exposed to the packages that you have available in Python. And even without understanding all the details or the technical details, you can use them and um, produce some uh, nice results. Yeah? Yeah. Is it the sound again? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. But uh, today's topic is, um, as I mentioned, is a package called Pandas. And um, uh, think of it as, essentially think of it as uh, some Excel uh, in, in Python. So what you can do with Pandas is that you read in uh, data, typically quite a bit large amounts of data, and then you can analyze this data. You can clean it up, you can sort it, you can identify the most interesting parts of it, and then you can do some kind of data analysis tool, uh, data analysis on it. And um, Pandas has been ex incredibly popular in the recent years, and um, I guess one of the main reasons is because uh, machine learning has become such a big topic. And when you want to do ma machine learning, you have to work with data. Right? And in order to um, work with real data, an important step is the cleaning up process and getting everything into place. And that's exactly what Pandas um, does for you. So it's, Pandas is kind of the first step if you want to do for for data analysis, for instance, machine learning. So a technical uh, overview, what, um, what can you pandas use for? Um, so essentially, it, uh, you use it when you have to work with uh, large data sets and um, have to operate on it. Um, so um, typical examples are you have some uh, comma-separated files that you want to read in and uh, work on. Maybe it also comes in an Excel format or even a LaTeX format, and you want to import and export that data and operate on it. Um, 
maybe you um, want to perform NumPy operations um, on that data um, or maybe visualize it with uh, Matplotlib. So um, Pandas is actually based on Numpa, NumPy, so uh, a lot, we will see this later on, that there's a lot of similarities. And then, of course, um, you might want to do some uh, data anal an analysis, like calculating statistics uh, on the data and asking questions like, what is the average of a certain column in my data? What is the median max? Um, is there correlation between two columns? Uh, and so on. And of course, the important part is also to clean up data. If you have missing information, uh, you might want to fill this out um, and maybe merge multiple columns. So uh, since we uh, talk about data analysis in this lecture, an important component of, of this is to actually get the data in the first place. And um, maybe, you, maybe the problem that you're working on already has a data source that you're working with, but there's also a lot of open data sources that you can play with. Um, so I, um, and often it's actually a lot of fun, it's very inspiring to um, be aware of this data set and figure out and think about what you can do with it. So um, the first one, um, I have now a list of data sources that might be interesting and uh, mostly um, focused on the Norwegian, uh, mostly Norwegian data. Um, so um, our go the Norwegian government is fairly open with regards to pay, uh, data, so we can get a lot of statistics about, um, for instance, employment rates, immigration rates, housing markets on ssb.no. So often you can download uh, Excel sheets or comma, comma se separated files uh, for this data. Then um, there used to be um, data for Finn. Um, unfortunately, they closed it down. So um, that's not uh, relevant anymore. That used to be really nice because you could query a lot of the market data instance for what's on the Finn, what's being selling on Finn, uh, but that's not available anymore. Um, but um, I guess you all know the Oslo bicycle, these blue bikes. Um, there you can actually um, download uh, live usage data and history data from all the trips that uh, people have done with the bikes. And uh, we will actually use this data to analyze how do people use um, how do people use the the Oslo bikes. Uh, then there's also router, of course, or public transport. Uh, there's also live uh, data uh, that you can download. So um, if you go to this URL, um, you can implement some travel planning and live departure information, and um, so this is my uh, personal project that I started some years ago is little Raspberry Pi um, with a, a e-ink display that I have in my uh, entrance and it shows me when the next uh, um, T-Banner leaves from my station. Right? So and it's very easy to do that um, once you have this uh, data available. Yeah, okay, so then there's, of course, there's weather data from UR, financial and economic data from quantal.com, and so on. So essentially, whenever you have a, a smart device, it's quite uh, likely that you can also um, get some sensor data from it. Okay, so um, then going back to Pandas, of course, there's, um, it's a popular framework, so there's lots of information out there. Um, I recommend the official Pandas documentation, which is always up to date and uh, I think fairly good. Um, there's also a, a Pandas cookbook um, that is fairly good. And then, of course, there's uh, uh, books written on this. So um, installation is fairly straightforward. If you have Anaconda, then it's already installed for you. Um, if you're in a, another Conda environment, uh, like Miniconda, then you can install it with Conda install pandas. And then if you're on a native Python distribution, you can use pip, like pip install pandas. And maybe minus minus user if you don't have admin access. So, um, okay, let's uh, start with some uh, very basic uh, I started with some very basic um, 
uh, with the fundamentals of pandas, and then we move on to some real data and to some analysis. So um, the first thing that we need to do is we need to import pandas. I also import this matplotlib inline, but this is just a Jupyter notebook uh, related. So um, typically what we need is uh, pandas itself. So import pandas. And um, because we will use it a lot, I use the shortcut pd. And then uh, we also need numpy. So I import numpy as well here. So that's done. So now we need to learn about the two fundamental data structures that Pandas has. And essentially, um, um, they're very uh, similar, um, but they're really important to know. So um, essentially, we have series and uh, data frames. It's a panda series and a panda uh, data frame. And um, a series is a, um, think of it as a one-dimensional um, list of items that are indexed, um, almost like a Python list. And it can have a label. So for instance, uh, we could have, this is a shopping uh, a purchase list. So we can have customer zero ordered three apples, customer one ordered two, two apples, and so on. So these one-dimensional lists are called series in Pandas. And then a data frame is simply um, a sequence of series with the same indices. Right, so a data frame is a two-dimensional um, array, um, again indexed with a label on the y-axis and a label on the x-axis. So that's, um, that's the most basic uh, data objects that we need to know about. So how do we create uh, pandas.series? So as I mentioned, it's a one-dimensional um, array, and um, it can hold any uh, data type. And, um, and so the simplest way to create that is to simply pass the list with all the values that you want to have in that series. Um, so um, you can see that I mix uh, numbers, but then you can also have, for instance, not a number values in there. So then we can execute this, and this is what it looks like. So um, you can see here the values that I've chosen, and this is the index um, that was automatically generated for all these values. You can also see that um, oh, you can also see that um, there was a D type uh, value chosen, in this case it's float64, and we know this d-type already from numpy. Right? So in fact, pandas relies on numpy to store the underlying data, and um, so um, there was a specific data type chosen to represent all these values, and the best data type to choose these is a float. Um, so even though we chose integers here, but uh, not a number is not an integer. So um, the only way to represent this list here is using a float. And so you can specify a D type, but if you don't, then it chooses a suitable data type, just like we know it from uh, NumPy. So then often it's uh, useful to specify the uh, the index label, remember by default, the index was simply numbers going from 0 to 1 to 3. Um, so you can be explicit about which uh, index you want to choose. So um, you just provide the index uh, property, and then the result is that you have um, both the index and, and the values chosen. So um, I should also mention here that the index, they don't actually need to be um, unique. Here. So uh, in principle, you can have um, the same index uh, twice. So like here now I have twice the A. Okay, so a very important type of data um, that um, you might work on is uh, time series data. So that simply means that we have one value for specific time points. And that's a very common type of data when you work with the sensor data, for instance. And um, okay, so how do you do that? Um, essentially, um, 
well, it's a bunch of uh, values, of course, and then the index is the timestamps where you observe where you observe the data. And um, well, one easy way to generate these indices is with a date range uh, function. So date range returns you give it a start date and an end date, and then you provide how many uh, observations you have, and it just returns a, a equidistant list of uh, dates. Right, so here you get uh, these six dates. Um, essentially, it's uh, one every few days. And then we can uh, create the series. And now you can see in our index, we have the dates, and then we have the values um, as the actual in the series. OK, so that was the one-dimensional data. So now we move on to the two-dimensional data. So, um, and these are called uh, data frames. Um, and um, the easiest way to create a, a data frame is from a, a dictionary. So essentially, uh, what you need to have in, in the dictionary is you have the uh, key, dictionary is always key value pairs, right? And um, in order to create a data frame, you use the key, use the, so, each uh, entry in that dictionary will be one column in our data frame. So essentially, the, the key always represents the name of the column. And then the value will be a list of all the values in that column. So um, if you use this example up here, uh, what you get is we have uh, apples and pears. And then we, in both cases, we have four entries. And so if we pass this to pandas.data frame, and we pass in this uh, dictionary, uh, then this is what we get. So we get a two-dimensional array with apples one column and pears another uh, column. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, I think I need to go out of this presentation mode. Okay, and then of course, um, this is quite um, abstract because we have these um, unlabeled uh, rows. So it makes more, much more sense to um, add also labels to the rows. And we do that exactly the same that we provide an index. So I use the same data, but now uh, I label all the rows by providing another index uh, right here. And so now we get a nice um, data table with um, essentially um, the customers on each rows and then the order list um, in each column. So we ordered three apples and six pairs uh, and so on. Okay, so now once we have this data, then um, the next important task is to extract uh, subparts of the data. And there's essentially um, um, yeah, the most important uh, function that we uh, need to be aware of is the lock uh, function. So um, um, lock um, takes in a uh, column name and then it returns um, that, uh, co so it takes the column name of a data, data frame and then it returns the associated uh, one dimension column, which is a series. So if I write purchase.lock, um, Hans, which uh, is here the, um, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, okay, so, um, yeah, so here we actually see we're actually returning the, um, the row. So we can write purchase.log Hans, so then we get uh, this uh, one dimensional row here. And in fact, this turns out to be also um, a data series. Missing things up. Okay. So then, of course, another um, common choice that you want to have is that you have two series, and do you want to make a data frame out of it? And um, the function that you're looking so the function that you're looking in in that case is called concat. So to concat concatenate um, 
two series. So um, here I created two series with the same indices, and then I called pt.concat s1, s2, s1. So then you get kind of three uh, columns, and uh, the zero in the second uh, column is uh, the same. And we can see what happens if the uh, indices don't match, match up. So if you have AB on the first series and AC on the second series, um, then you can see that uh, Pandas simply um, adds none values to... Um, so the first series here had AB. Um, the second series had AC, but not B. So then in the second column, we get a NAN here for B, because there was no B value provided. Same thing for the first one and the last one. We had no values for C provided, so you end up with a NAN here. OK, so um, of course, in practice, we, we don't want to um, hard code our lists that we want to operate on, but instead we read the data from a file. So um, Pandas comes with um, read functions that allows us to read in data. So um, let's have a look at these. So there's a bunch of functions that you can choose from. Um, you can read from the most important ones, uh, read CSV. So this is reading from a comma se separated file. Read Excel is to read from an Excel file. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think these are actually the ones that are used uh, most. And we will use them also in a second. OK, so that was kind of the basics, the very core basics of the pandas data types. Any questions? OK, so then let's move on. And um, I want to show you a, a concrete uh, example uh, on how we can use pandas. And um, to do that, we will use the um, usage data of the Oslo vehicle. So um, what um, kind of uh, questions can we answer uh, with that? We want to answer, for instance, um, what is kind of the peak um, uh, well, so imagine, right, the reason why we do this is because maybe your task is to identify where should we add new bike stations, so where should we remove uh, new bike stations, right? So can the data tell us something about uh, maybe we need to make um, increase the size of a bike station? So all these kind of strategic questions that we might uh, want to pass on to the city. So... Um, and um, it's exactly these kind of data analysis that we want to do. So for instance, identify the um, high and low points of a bike station usage, maybe over a year, a week, or a day. Which ones are the most and least used bike stations? Which ones are the most and least used bike routes? And maybe visualize uh, the station and the usage uh, in Oslo use on, on a map. OK, so now to get started, the first thing that we need to do is to download the data. Uh, luckily, um, this is uh, easily available on, uh, on this website here. So for instance, I downloaded the data from August and September 2016. And um, you can see that there's essentially, uh, yeah, these are the uh, files that I got here. So I actually also have August here. But there's, uh, there's comma-separated files. Uh, and uh, about uh, 21 megabyte per, per month. So let's see what they look like. So we can, um, I just print the first few lines using the head command in, uh, in the best shell. Um, and so this is now the October data. So uh, what do we have? The so first line tells us the, um, the columns. So what we have is we have a start station, um, then we have the start time, then we have the end time, end station, and then we have the end time. But then you can already see here in the, for instance, the first row, 283 is the first station. Um, that first trip was at six o'clock in the morning and eight seconds. Um, then that trip stopped at station 238 at uh, six o'clock and nine minutes. Right, so 
someone cycled for nine minutes here. Uh, and so on, right? So um, we can check how, how long this is. So um, I use the wc command to count the length of a file. And you can see that we have um, the first, this one tells us the number of lines. So we have 242,759 trips, right? probably one less, but 240,000 trips uh, just in October. OK, so now we want to read this in. Um, of course, um, this is a comma separated file. So I use the read CSV function. I provide the file name. And I also specify the separator, um, how the columns are separated. In this case, it was a comma. Yeah, I can load this in. It goes fairly quick. And then we can look at the results. And you can see that it's already um, uh, worked uh, really nicely. And um, um, the first row here was already used as the labels of the data frame. So we have the start station, start time, end station, and end time formatted in a nice way. OK, this is a long list now. Um, but you can see, in total, we have these 242,000 uh, rows. So um, as you can already see, it's um, quite annoying to have so long uh, lists here in the output. So what we will use extensively is the head function, um, which restricts the um, which restricts the data frame to only the five top um, outputs. So the same thing also, I think, works with tail. So then you get the last uh, five ones. OK. So now the next thing that we should do after loading the data in is to check that um, we have the right data types on the data. So um, what I do is I um, call trips.dtypes that shows us all the columns and the data types that would, was used for it. So um, uh, let's do this here. And uh, you can see that um, for the start station, we got an in64. Uh, so that uh, makes sense, because the stations are always integers. Then the start time here is simply an object. Um, so that's a bit strange, because uh, we, we hope that we get something like a date time object instead, because here we have uh, dates. And then the end station is a float 64. So that's also a bit strange, because we expected integers. And then the end time, again, is just an object, which re represents the most general data type, instead of being um, a, a, a date. So um, clearly, something um, failed here. And we need to improve the, uh, um, the import of the data. So then what you need to do is you go to the read CSV uh, documentation and you figure out what's going on. And it turns out that uh, for dates, we need to uh, specify, um, we need to tell uh, pandas about uh, date columns. And so there's this pass dates um, parameter where we can specify columns that should be interpreted as dates. So in this case, it's the start time and end time. Uh, and then I did this yesterday, and this used to work. And then it turns out it doesn't work anymore with use, newest pandas. And um, it turns out that um, when you have a, um, so in October, there was a, a change from summertime to wintertime, um, which means that uh, when we calculated with regards to UTC, uh, the Greenwich Mean Time, then there's a shift from two hours to one hour difference. And it turns out that Pandas doesn't support this by default. Uh, so all the data frames, all the dates always have to have the same um, time difference. Uh, and then you have to provide your own parser. So that's what I've done here. So um, you can see that these kind of nasty, you start, you expect uh, things to work, and then they don't work. And then you have to kind of work yourself slowly towards um, fix all the issues on the way. Yes, so um, with this lambda, we can now see what happens. So I read the data in again. And now you can see it takes a lot longer. So um, the star means that it's still working. Um, OK, so it finished. And that's the reason why it takes so much longer now is because it needs to pass all these states. 
But uh, if we check the D types again, we now this looks much better. So um, both the start time and the end time have, be, have been identified as um, the correct data types. Okay. And so now you can also see that, um, yeah, no, it doesn't matter. Um, so I just want to point out here that um, before we had six o'clock and uh, two hour shifts, so that I think that was the string. Yeah, it was six o'clock and two hour shift. And now you can see that um, the way we represent it is actually in UTC time. So now it's four o'clock and zero um, shift. Just so clearly um, the interpretation worked in this case. So then the second problem was that um, the end station was supposed to be an integer, but it's not an integer, it was a float. So um, then um, what in the one way to fix this is to specify the data type for the end station. So I can simply say end station colon NP64, in 64, to force NumPy, please use an in 64 for this uh, column. Okay, so if you, tr if you try that, unfortunately there's an error. So let's see what it says. It says integer column has not a number values in uh, column two. Okay, so in other words, the end station, um, sometimes in the end station we have uh, not a number value. So does anyone have an idea why, why that might be the case? Yeah. Exactly, so there were some trips where someone took a bike but never returned it, okay? So um, uh, this can of course happen and um, then we don't have a value for the end station. And so essentially we don't have a fix for this. So now we understand why um, the end time has to be of type float 64 because that's the only data type that where we can be seen, not, not a number. Okay, we can, uh, it's maybe also interesting to see how many of these, I mean, it could be two cases, right? It could be that um, on October the 31st, someone started a trip and ended it on September, uh, what was it, November um, the 1st, right, in November. Then um, we simply don't have it in our data, part of our data. Or it could be that someone stole the bike. But uh, let's, maybe let's see how many of these trips we have. Yeah, so I mean, there's about 20. And um, they started here October the 1st. Yeah, I mean, so this one, I, this was at the very beginning of the data, uh, data table. So I don't think there was a 30 day trip, right? Uh, this looks like uh, suspicious. So I, maybe, maybe this bike was stolen. Um, okay, so now we have our data uh, available. So now, of course, um, a very important part is selecting um, relevant uh, data of, of our data frame. And so in Pandas, you need to know the most important ones are three operations to select data. Um, we have the indexing notation, which is just the square brackets that we, that we know from normal Python arrays also, or Python lists. And then there's the log function and the ilog function. Um, so I just want to show you these different, or explain to you the difference of, of these. So the index notation you can use to um, select uh, columns. So, um, so the square bracket notation. So you can simply write trips, start time, and then you only get the start time series, right? Which is a one, one column. Uh, data. Um, this also works um, by providing, if you want to extract multiple columns, so you can use the square brackets and then um, inside the square brackets you provide a list of columns that you want to extract. So in this case it's start time and end time. And of course now the result will be another data frame. Right? So if you just extract a single column you get a series out. If you extract two columns, you get a, a two-dimensional um, table out, which is a data frame. Okay, 
So then, so this is, is a bit confusing, but in principle, you can also use this uh, square bracket notation to select rows. So you, you can actually do this, uh, or you can't. Um, uh, let's see. Trips, I think you should be able to. Um, no, maybe not. So, um, but there is a way to also use the square brackets to um, extract rows, but it's um, it's really not recommended, and it's because it becomes really confusing, um, especially if you have the same labels on the y and x axis. So, um, I don't recommend it, and uh, as you can see, I don't even know how to do it. But um, so, if you want to select rows, then or rows and columns, then a much better way of doing that is using the log function. So the log function allows you to explicitly, um, or is a more explicit alternative for selecting rows. So the way it, uh, the syntax is data frame .log, square bracket, then the rows that you want to select, and then the columns that you want to select. So a simple example, um, you want, we want to select row one, four, five, and um, we want to select uh, column start time and end time. Right? So now we get the subset uh, of the table with these rows and columns. So you can also use, if you're interested in an entire row, then you can use the uh, double dot uh, notation. Instead of specifying which rows, you can just say uh, colon. And then, um, then there's an iLock. So iLock is essentially exactly the same as lock, just that it always works on the indices. So with iLock, you always need, the arguments will always be integers um, instead of names. So here, see for the lock, we use the names of the columns. Uh, in iLock, you provide um, the position of the columns instead. So in some cases, you might not know the names, but you might know the positions. So then it's easier to use iLock. So in this case, in this example here, here I also use the colon notation. I select the first five rows um, and columns zero to two. It's essentially the first two uh, columns. Any questions so far? Okay, so then we can, um, of course, we want to visualize our results. So um, um, Pandas comes with uh, different pl uh, plotting backends, and by default it uses Pandas, uh, it uses Matplotlib. So, um, for instance, uh, if you're interested in plotting the start stations, the first 100 start stations, you can just call the plot function. So then what you get is um, you get the index on the x-axis, and then you get the start station ID on the y-axis. But of course, this plot is not so meaningful, but um, you get the idea. So then same thing also works with uh, multiple columns, and you get multiple colors. So we can plot um, the start and the end station. Maybe we shouldn't plot quite so many. Okay. So again, this is still not so uh, meaningful because the start station are just these abstract integers, but um, yeah, uh, this is how you can plot multiple columns if you want to. But now it becomes more interesting. So um, let's start this uh, simple first. Let's do the first 5,000. So, um, Uh, one of the problems here is that um, we have um, the uh, y, the x-axis is simply uh, the station IDs, uh, sorry, the index of the trips. So it would be much more useful, useful to actually have the date and time on the x-axis. And um, you can specify that in, in the plot argument. You say the x-axis you want to use start time, and then on the y-axis you want to plot the start station and the end station uh, columns. Okay, so now we get this, uh, okay, there's not so much insight yet, 
Um, but I'm plotting here the first, let's plot the first 100 ones. Okay, not so much structure here, but um, maybe what you can see is, this is at four o'clock in the morning, right? And you can see that, um, well, from four to five, let's go a bit longer. Let's, let's go to f the first 500. So this is from four to seven. So um, you can see at least already that there's kind of an increase of um, usage going from four o'clock in the morning uh, to seven o'clock in the morning. Okay, so I mean, that's one trend, but it becomes even more interesting if you start plotting more. So let's plot the first 50,000. Okay, um, it's fairly dense, not so much to see, but now let's plot the first, um, so it was the, this is now the, the first 50,000 trips. And suddenly we get these strange white um, blocks in the trips. Um, so does anyone have any ideas what that could be? Yeah, so that's nighttime. So we have trips always during the day, right? And then suddenly it stops. And then we have trips during the day. So um, just by looking at this data, we can identify when these stations are disabled and, and when they're open. Um, okay, so then you can also change the type of the plot. So instead of uh, plotting these as, as um, line plots, you can provide the kind argument to change this uh, to a bar plot. Okay, so then we get this. Um, but maybe more interesting is um, histograms. So they work, um, essentially what they tell you is how often was each, uh, what was the usage of each, um, um, of each value in a column. So if we um, plot the histogram of a start station, it tells us how often watch was uh, each, uh, how was that start, sta start station used. Right? So here, start station 160 was used 60,000 times, 180, also about 60,000, start station 200 was used quite a bit, and so on. So, um, Okay, maybe uh, we stop here and then we start again in 15 minutes.